It's wonderful to have you here, Nien. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, so great to be here, Katie. I'm excited about this. Yeah. We've got so many amazing things to cover. It's going to be super tight to fit it all in 30 minutes, but I'm sure we'll manage. And yes, it, I mean, it's wonderful. We met at the Enneagram conference in Stockholm maybe six months ago or so. Always great to meet people offline first. And we both share a deep interest on the Enneagram. And today we'll maybe touch on it a bit. We will look more into how we can be fulfilled and use this as part of our way towards fulfillment, right? This is one of the key aspects of using the Enneagram. Okay, so let's dig in, let's dive straight in. How do you feel that people can actually use their values and live a more values and purpose base in order to be fulfilled, right? So let me reformulate. How can we use our values as a compass and have this strong sense of, you know, clarity around what meaning and purpose is so that we can live in a more fulfilled way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say that, uh, that learning, you know, you mentioned the Enneagram, that learning our basic Enneagram personality type is a way in which we sort of like develop this map toward like our authentic self. Right. So our own values is very different from the values that we took on, whether in our childhood, through, you know, our our family environment, our spirituality or religion of origin. There are all these shoulds or all these ideas about what like what we think we want, what we should want, et cetera. And there's something about understanding like that personality type structure as almost like the persona or the facade of you. And then being able to dig in beneath that into like what's true for you. So like my passion is supporting people in like this kind of sacred inner listening, right? Because if we don't have that, I work with a, a ton of leaders who, who are very successful, right? In the outside world, like they're very capable people, very skilled. And oftentimes by the time they come to me, there's something nagging at them where they're not completely happy with where they are. Or, or maybe it's like, you know, after that next goal is accomplished, right? after that next vacation is taken like the thing that you thought you wanted and you realize oh it's not actually satisfying like so what we could do using the Enneagram is we we can get beneath that by hearing like the typical stories that your particular egoic persona or your slash Enneagram type will will tend to tell you so we can give specific examples I can use you if we want <laughs> yeah definitely use me so okay just to, to give some uh some info to the people listening. My Enneagram personality is seven, which is a sort of Meyer Briggs ENFP, which is a sort of disc high I, then followed by S, seven wing six. And this means that I'm uh, like an eternal kid, <laughs> means I'm uh, driven by fun. So I like fun and enthusiastic, have FOMO a lot, and um, yeah, do lots of different things. And that's probably why my company's the focus P because I've learned to focus. <laughs> And that's something seven did a lot. So yes, use me as an example, Nim, by all means. Yes, yes. Well, it sounds like you're already well, like on your path, because that would be exactly the recommendation. You know, for those who come to me who are any grand type sevens, I'll give you just a few examples of others. Like I had this guy who's a founder of this like startup company. And like, as he was... Um, managing uh, those below him, like he couldn't make a decision of, about like what course to take. Like he was an idea generator, but there was a struggle, you know, with the people who worked with him of like, well, choose a path. Like that was so difficult for him to like commit to one path. And after working together, like, so not only was he able to commit to it, but they ended up selling the company like in this like magnificent way because he was able to like kind of uh, settle in um to to a choice point if you will and and so understanding that the seven's basic structure is about like escaping from pain and escaping from limitation through 
maintaining sort of endless choices and options and ideas, right? And so that if one might not work, you're willing, you're, you know, you can jump to the other. It's a lot of nodding here, you know? And so, so there's, there's a gift in that, right? Because sevens have this agility of mind, this ability to see things that most of us can't see, like just in their own heads sitting there, right? You have all these options already generated. But the idea is that um, sevens have a fear around committing to one. And so understanding that underlying thing allows us to be like, oh, if I'm a, if I'm willing to be with the the strain and the pain of feeling limited, what I find is that by staying, by grounding, by committing, there's a richness, there's an inner adventure, you know, there's space for something that that wouldn't have unfolded had I not stayed you know, right here. So that's the, an understanding of how fulfillment can happen, like in sevenness. Yeah. That's a really good example. And I can definitely see that. I mean, in me, obviously everything you said, but I can see that that with relationships and with uh, a place that that commitment leads to that depth. Uh, and where I struggle most is still in business. I still like to do a lot of things but I don't want it to be you know focused primarily on me <laughs> let's not turn it into you know oh, uh, Enneagram <laughs> but what I want to look at more is how this is a good example and this the, these are the sort of things I still need to work on but what I'd love to know is okay how through the Enneagram or through understanding our personality in general can we get to that place of fulfillment so this was using seven as an example but in general what do you feel is like the barrier that we need to go through like in the case of seven it was commitment for instance as an example or focus but in general what do you feel are the sort of barriers we need to go through to get to this place of fulfillment mm -hmm. yeah well I think the, the the general idea is that um each Enneagram type, like there are nine different types around the circle. I don't know how basic, you know, we want to get here around it, but let's just say there are the nine different Enneagram types, personality types. The Enneagram is much deeper than the Enneagram of personality, but that's just basically personality is like threshold, right? Like to the wilderness of, of our magnificent and like dynamic self. It's like the doorway, if you will. And so what we find is that naming our personality type, um, is a required first step because there's something about recognizing, hey, you know, I've identified, like you historically might have identified with, well, I'm the fun one or I'm the interesting one, right? And and what happens is you, you think that identification uplifts you when it actually limits you, right? Because you are more than just that. Like you have capacities that are well beyond that. Here I am going back to seven because I love specific examples and I, <laughs> you know, right? So, but if you didn't know that that was your persona, then you'd over identify with. So the beginning is naming our Enneagram type. And a lot of times people are like, well, I don't wanna, you know, I'm not just one type. Well, that's the idea. But the, the whole idea is historically, we tend to identify with a certain persona and the Enneagram names the one that you identify with unconsciously or consciously. And so by doing so, the idea is that like it, it, the Enneagram doesn't put you in a box, right? It helps you see the box you're already in and therefore helps you to transcend it. And so that transcendence is about like, whoa, there's this whole field of like me, of who I am, my wholeness that wasn't even available. For instance, I'll use myself as an example now. I identify as type three, which is often seen in leaders, you know, in the world because like threes are the achievers, the performers of the Enneagram, right? There's something about like, I am what I do that that is like the essence of being. Well, what happens is if, my identity or my worth is about what I do, then my life is like an endless to-do list, right? Threes are notorious for moving the goalpost back. You know, as soon as you've achieved a goal, like you move it back. And it's like, there's never satisfaction and never a sense of well-being in that. And so this notion of like, I am not just what I do, right? That my wholeness and my worth is like bigger than that. Like that's the beginning of the journey, but you first have to name that that was, that was your fallacy in the first place, right? That that was your limiting belief in the first place. That's what the Enneagram helps us to do. And it helps us like to do that in like nine different ways, right? Again, these are just snapshots of like what that might look like. But by understanding that, then what I come to recognize is, oh, wow, 
I live very differently. Or I should say, I lived very differently when I thought that that my worth, like my value to you was earned continually. That means that in every moment, there's a sense of hustle, right? There isn't a sense of peace. There isn't a sense of well-being. And also um, that kind of mentality creates competitiveness rather than collaboration. And I remember most of my life, I felt extremely lonely and I couldn't understand why. Like it, like people could just feel it in me. Like, I'm not here to connect with you. Like I'm here to win, <laughs> you know? I was sad, you know, but I didn't know because it was so like unconsciously within me. So the first thing was consciously recognizing that spirit in me. And then the second thing was going, oh, you know, having compassion for that attitude of, oh, that's how you think you'll be loved. But it actually takes you further and further away from love. It takes you further away from like knowing your own belovedness. So if you will just stop, like the willingness to pause, to stop, to practice being, right? To, 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 to not just um, think about what I could accomplish in a moment, but how each moment is for me, like how I can enjoy it. How can I savor? It? How can I like, like take the time to like, look at the tree that's outside my window right here. You know, you can't see it because it's dark right now. It's only AM in the United States, but, but like, I actually enjoy life now. <laughs> It's amazing, right? And I enjoy it because I, I believe I, I deserve it. Whereas before it's like, like there was an endless quest to deserve life, like that, that aspect, yeah. And so that's again, just one example of how understanding the Enneagram could point me toward wholeness. I think the Enneagram points us all toward wholeness, but we start with different orientations, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and I, I wanna add something about like, in my experience, naming type and seeing the characteristics of the prison, essentially, that we each live in through this egoic identification is just the first step. In my experience, if people don't have some sort of mindfulness or meditative practice, it can be very, very difficult to transcend that that way of being, right? But there's something about being able to self-observe right? Which I would say is different from self-reflection. Because, you know, when I was younger, I was like, I was a philosophy major. I was very self-reflective. And by that, I meant, let like, mean, I would see af well after the fact, well, I know why I do that. I just can't stop doing that. I know exactly why I do that, right? And so many of us come to that place where we're like, oh, yes, well, I know what I should and shouldn't be doing, but I can't stop. And what I find is mindfulness practices, like meditation, it, um, Victor Frankl said uh, that there, you know, in in the space between like in, stimu in stimulus and response, there is a space, right? Between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our freedom, right? Meditation for me carves a larger space between stimulus and response. And it's like, oh, I don't have to act right now. Like if I'm willing to pause, if I'm willing to stay with the sense that I feel worthless and empty, then I start to fill up. It's not by going after that thing that I will fill up because that's endless. Like that's an endless journey, right? That never fulfills. And so that ability to stay, to be like, like that's through like the practice of meditation and mindfulness, which is part of like the core of what I teach everybody I work with. I work with communities, I work with organizations, I work with individuals, I work with couples and families. And, and in the end, like if you don't have that capacity to like be with in the moment, right? Like be with yourself. Like it's very hard to transcend that something. So yeah, yeah. I definitely feel that a lot of people can identify with that sort of hyperachiever, goal-oriented, achievement-oriented perspective, even if they aren't uh, type three, because there are a lot of people who are driven by these achievements. I know I recognize myself a lot in what you just said. I have a lot of three energy. <laughs> a lot of people think I'm a three. Um, but it's also because uh, as a type seven, I have this both with achievements at work, 
you know, the never enough, the further, the goalpost, that once you arrive, the next one, but I also have it with fun. So I have it with the hobbies and the social life. So it's like a double combo. So one of the things I had to learn most, very similar to what you shared, be already be grateful for what you have, enjoy in the moment, show that gratitude, be present and calm down, right? Relax. Not always this sort of constant chase for more, more achievement, more things, more hobbies, more. Um, yes. So I think that was one of the things I know I worked a lot with my coach. I remember almost being in tears and saying, but it's just never enough. I was just thinking enough in terms of time, enough in terms of goals, enough in terms of hobbies. And it's just a sort of greed for more things and stimulation. But that comes exactly as you shared from this avoidance, right? Especially in type seven avoidance of the pain. But most people also avoid there's always something that they're uncomfortable with that they're not facing maybe they're not aligned in their career and they'll just sort of avoid and also loved what you said about Viktor Frankl and that space because it's exactly what I say about meditation I always say you know between what happens that stimuli and the response there's that gap and when you meditate you strengthen it and that's when you're particularly impulsive as I used to be and many people are, and you snap quickly, or you end up doing something fast, you need this gap to change that response. You need this gap to not stop or, or not act in a rush or not be impulsive. And that is really the best way to train it is meditation. Of course, there are other ways, but I really feel that's the the core so love that and so nice to hear someone else say it and explain it so well <laughs> then I could just be when I'm explaining it to someone next time I'll be like wait a minute open up the interview just show people and then oh, you did it beautifully so thank you and it's so nice to hear that uh, we are aligned on this um, okay so coming back to uh, transcending our personality and fulfillment I love this theme of fulfillment. Someone asked me this morning, what's my mission? You know, what's my goal? What's my vision? What's my mission? I just said, typical seven. <laughs> I just said, I want people to be happy. But what I really mean is I want them to be fulfilled and obviously not in an instant gratification type of way, but in a deeply fulfilled, living meaningful, purposeful, intentional lives uh, without the overwhelm, without the clutter and finding that peace of mind, alignment and deep, you know, spiritual and uh, intellectual and mental growth that they need for that sense of fulfillment. So love the theme of fulfillment. What is one thing, meditation aside, that you feel really supports people to be more fulfilled? Aside from knowing the Enneagram type, and meditating, what do you feel really helps people to feel fulfilled? Mm. Well, I feel like um, I'm just repeating myself a little bit, but it's I'm so passionate about this notion of presence. Yes, that presence is itself. It, it's like valuing the journey right over the destination. Like there is a way in which I'll say that, like when you come to know the Enneagram at depth, you understand that both sevens and threes are future oriented types, right? And so like, so there's a way that each of us, no matter what our type is not present, some are past oriented, right? Some are oriented toward one aspect of the present moment, but presence is something different altogether. And it's the capacity to be like here, to embrace like the, the, the joy and blessing of our sheer aliveness, right? Like our, our being, like that to me is when people find fulfillment, right? It's only in the present moment because we're only ever in the present moment, right? Like we're like, so as soon as we're in the future, right? That's the present moment. But like if our radar and the Enneagram teaches us what our respective radars are, are for the future, are for the past, are for what's wrong for type ones. It's like what's wrong in the present rather than the fullness of the present. Like we're not present, like in that like capital P presence way that allows us to savor. And I'll even give the seven as an example, you know? So when you come to learn the Enneagram, you come to understand that each of the numbers or each of the types has like a default um, a addictive emotional habit, if, if you will. 
Some people call that the vice or the passion of the type. But essentially what you described, Katie, is that this, for the seven, it's called gluttony, right? <laughs> And, and gluttony is like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Like it's never enough, right? Like, and it's jumping around. It's not like all of one thing. It's like, oh, for fear of missing out, it's a little bit of everything. And so that energy, again, there's a blessing to that because you have agility, right? But what happens is it becomes fixated and you can't stop when you want to. So what about when you grab a little bit of something and it's amazing, right? The seven's like, but what about that next thing? That's the fixated seven and the seven that becomes like that acquires the virtue of the seven, which we just call sobriety, right? We're just like, like, there's just this like enoughness of the moment that's like, oh, I can savor the joy of this juicy good thing, right? Without starting to already think about the next thing. Sevens are notorious for being on a vacation and planning the next one in their own heads, right? And it's sort of like, it's like, stop already. Like you say you want joy, but I don't believe you because joy is here and where are you? You know, joy is here and where are you? So that's just an example of like, so there's a degree of presence. So every type, one can say that each of the personality types is one way we um, are occluded from pure presence. And so each type has a different way that that happens. I, I briefly mentioned the type one, there's something about, there's always something wrong with what's here, right? And so there isn't like a gratitude for the isness and an acceptance of the isness of being of this moment. There's always something to correct or fix, you know? But it's like, again, it's endless. Right. And, and so, you know, A Course in Miracles, which is this wisdom path that I love, says the ego's mantra is seek, but do not find. And so let, understanding your Enneagram type is about understanding the way that your ego seeks and seeks and never finds because it's looking in the wrong direction, whether it's looking for more fun, looking for more achievement, looking to perfect everything like you will not be happy, the ego says, until that's acquired. But, it, but it's set up to be an endless search, right? When instead it's like drop in, in and down into your being. Yeah. So that's the path I teach people. So yeah. again, it's not about not striving. It's not about not having joy. It's about having the capacity to experience and savor the joy that you've created, the achievement that you've made, the perfection that you've cultivated, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's exactly that, right? The ego is striving as you said, either for fun as a seven or achievement of a three or whatever it is, and never satisfied. My whole never enoughness, that's a lot better now. It happens from time to time. Of course, our personalities come back up, of course. But when I did have that, it was chronic, you know, this just chronic feeling of, you know, gluttony, more not fitting things in. Uh, and then once you learn to be more present, it, you know, it gets better somehow you get to appreciate what you already have i i'd love it if you'd briefly said a word for each one because now i'm thinking people listen i'll be like okay we get the seven <laughs> and they'll be like okay now we're one and three and they'll be like but i'm neither of these so we're not going to cover all the personalities uh, in depth but it would be nice maybe just the vice or that passion for each yeah, yeah. personality because i think people will already see if they're a scattered seven with uh, gluttony and want to do everything or an achievement three or perfectionism one but it would be nice to briefly do all of them so maybe if you oh. could just a you know couple of sentences for each one I think people listening otherwise I'll be like no I want to know mine <laughs> right right so I guess I'll uh, I'll go back to one again that notion of there's always something to correct or fix in the moment and I would add that ones tend to think and the burden is on me and so the ones tend to carry the weight of the world on their shoulders. And it, it's like, you don't even realize that you're the one who took it on. You're resentful that no one else is carrying the burden, <laughs> but you volunteered. <laughs> ones don't really realize that. There's like a basic assumption that of course they should. And then this is about unraveling that basic assumption. It's a flawed assumption, but, but ones tend to believe they're right. Like there's a notion that like, oh, this is the way things are. And so again, it's unraveling sort of the story of your type. So for twos, there's this notion of being um, indispensable, being needed, right? So twos tend to overgive or like to be seen as generous and giving. And so, so 
imagine a lot of twos end up in relationship, whether it's at work or at home with a lot of dependent people, <laughs> you know, with not much mutuality, like when are people going to give back? And, and so that gentle nudge to just stop that track of giving to get that the two has that is often unconscious. The two doesn't necessarily want to get the same thing it gives, but it wants to get like appreciation in its own way, a sense of love, right? And if you need me, you won't leave me. There's so, so much embedded in that. But what if you knew that your needs are just intrinsically valuable, right? That maybe others want to actually support your needs. It's a total paradigm shift, right? But fulfillment, a, a, creates a space where you're not always scanning for other people's needs, right? Like that's that's the preoccupied space that, that twos live in. We've already talked about threes. Again, that sense of, it's not just about achievement. I, I want to say there's a nuance. It's about being perceived as successful, right? And sort of letting go of like that perception over like my personal like joy or value, Right. For fours, it's kind of the opposite of sevens, where for fours, there's a, an issue of over identification with suffering. And like there's a trivialization of joy, like like I reject joy as as not part of my psychological being. And I wonder why I'm not happy. Right. There's something. <laughs> right? But there's this idea of the broken wheel gets the grease. Right. Like that force believe, oh, yes, well, I get more attention because I'm broken right? Not because I'm whole. So there's an over-identification with that. You know, for fives, there's this um, issue of, of believing that if I know enough, then I can finally take action. So fives tend to be the researchers, the investigators, et cetera. And so we need to back off from that so that you can just take bold and, and what feels to you like risky action. You know, for sixes, I'm trying to go really quickly here because I know we're short on time, but for sixes, there's this belief that, um, I have to guard against what could go wrong. The world's full of danger, right? And so sixes, unlike sevens, like rarely ever plan for future joy. They plan against future disaster. <laughs> and so the mind becomes preoccupied with planning against disaster. And again, not being able to like relish like the good of, of the moment or even of the future. Like there isn't a planning for best case scenarios, right? So that's what I work with sixes to do. We talked about sevens again, like of like um, not... Try, like I, what I like to say about sevens is sevens think they're optimistic, but there's something about they're optimistic about the future, but not about the present. Like there's nothing here ever, right? <laughs> like it's like the present holds nothing. It's over there. It's never here, you know? And so the, the eights illusion is like, like there's, there's an us versus them mentality that life is a fight. So with eights like that, like if you get up, remember, remember not to put on that armor. Like you don't even realize you're putting on armor to go into that meeting. And how is you putting on armor going to affect how you show up at that meeting? It's kind of like that energy of like againstness, right? For nines, like there's this basic like desire to remain peaceful via being undisturbed. And so there's this piece where, where oh, if there's conflict, I simply like avoid it. And by avoiding it, by not asserting myself, I may not be asserting like my truth or my purpose, right? Like I can't live a fulfilled life where like I get to matter if like, if my need to stay undisturbed, to have like peace is so, is compulsive, right? It's not that peace is bad. It's when it becomes compulsive that anything that's going to negate that gets written off. And so there's a fullness of life that doesn't get lived. Again, this is the most superficial, just touching on each of the numbers, you know, in the interest of time. But yeah, so those are just a few of the things that I work with people, uh, depending on their type, like to support them in like, oh, there's another way, right? You just didn't know. Instead, you double down on your ego type. You're just like, oh, like, I'm not happy yet. The three says, I will strive harder. <laughs> right? Seven's like, it will be the next fun thing. Like the, the ego doubles down. It doesn't know why things get emptier and they get less fulfilled rather than more, right? And so, yeah, practicing meditative practices to cultivate presence, to savor what you have. You're not going to lose your skill set. You know, you're not going to lose that basic ability to be joyful or plan or scheme, if you will. You know? But like, as a seven, right? And that's always in you. But what you will gain is like a fullness of you. Right. Yeah. So.
Mm -hmm. nope. And thank you so much for covering the, the the different types also, because I feel the people listening will at least be able to identify maybe one more than the others, and that might invite them on the journey if they're not already familiar with the Enneagram. And of course, it's a lot more complex than this. But so I also love how you shared that we fall down the trap of the egoic trap, which is we think that you know the next achievement or giving more or you know being perfect or perfect or all these things will bring us finally that fulfillment and it's such a trap and I feel that if we don't know the Enneagram I mean there's other ways to to discover these things through you know spiritual work and meditation and being more grounded and there are other ways to see this but I think Enneagram is this like you said, such a shortcut because yes. you instantly see this is what I'm doing all the time. This is what I feel will bring me joy. It's not working. Now what? And that's when you go down the, okay, well, let me be more, you know, grounded. Let me be more present. Let me appreciate what I have now. Let, let stop always pulling into the future. And there's also, and I think you also mentioned this now, this fear that if you stop, right? Like as a seven, oh, if you stop, you're not going to have fun anymore. Or the three, if you stop striving, what about all your goals? What about you still want? But it's not true. When you are more present, you can still work on your goals. You can still have fun activities in a social life. And you'll appreciate them more, as you shared at the beginning, because you're present. And I think this is a huge learning curve for a lot of people. They think, oh, if I just like relax and let go and just be present, uh, then then I'm just like go lose all my goals and and, and not be fulfilled but it's I not totally like thought that. I was <laughs> I yeah was everyone that thinks that happen. at the beginning <laughs> I was like what if I do nothing <laughs> what if I, I like, just said never <laughs> yes no. yes well I do have to say it like a basic framework so if you if you google the Enneagram you'll see that it's a circle with nine uh dots around it right but the circle for me represents our wholeness and, and so understanding that, again, like we, people are like, oh, when we identify your point on the Enneagram, we're not saying this is all that you are. In fact, we're saying this is just the beginning. Like what you get to do by knowing your point now is open up to the whole circle, the fullness of you. Like, and so again, there's still a base where you would still like have home base at seven, but now you have other points available to you other qualities of your humanity available to you and thus you have more choice because we think every day we wake up and we have this free will and we're making all these choices well I'm like well well yeah your days are all looking pretty much the same <laughs> you strive and strive and strive <laughs> like you know and so we so that's where we're unconsciously just choosing choosing what the ego wants right and thinks it's going to give you fulfillment and it doesn't and it doesn't and it doesn't and then you try harder and it doesn't right and whereas like oh now you have other qualities of humanity available like you you, you said earlier that that I have like some six energy I'm like you know thank god that's more collaborative energy like that's the like very different from like unhealthy three competitive energy right you know like there's space there's more space like inside me, there's more space for other people as I practice this. There's space for everyone to like live our highest lives, right? Like that's like, there's a spaciousness that's created. And, and so I love like the circle represents our wholeness, but I think it also represents like our unity, you know, and, and that like the belonging of all people. And so teaching the Enneagram from like this framework is so important to me to be like, yeah, you know what? We are fundamentally whole you know, and like, let's move toward you experiencing that, knowing it beyond just your head, but like feeling that and being with that and savoring that. And yeah, and in that wholeness, wow, now you have access to all this potentiality in your humanity that you didn't have access to before when you're over identified with that little point, right? On the Enneagram that you thought was you, that you thought you had to be, right? Yeah, so just wanted to share that. Oh, oh, yours. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, uh, that was such a, a beautiful way to 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 conclude the the podcast. And I have to say, Neen, that you're probably the person I interviewed that gave me the most goosebumps. <laughs> I was like goosebumps from head to toe, head to toe. Like my whole body was like pulsating, and then I felt it on top of my head. So I don't know what you're doing, but you're doing it right because I'm uh, highly sensitive to to energy, which is a very different topic. But in general, to, to vibrations and goosebumps, I also get them sometimes when I listen to music. 
And I'm pretty certain, I get it a few times in interviews, but I'm pretty certain this is the interview where I've had it the most. I was literally like shivers, head to foot, head to foot. So beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful. So good to, to chat with you and yeah, get to know a little bit about you and talk about you. <laughs> talk about my type. <laughs> But, Just yeah. as a case example. Yeah, so appreciate it. Thank you. Amazing. Being. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. It was really an amazing conversation. And where can people find you if they want to get in touch and find out more? Yeah, evolvingenneagram.com. So, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so, so much. And uh, yes, and hopefully <laughs> you guys listening are super curious into the Enneagram. Message me, message Neen, find out more about it. It's really, really worth the journey. And if you're already into it, then hopefully you still learned something new or got shivers like I did. <laughs> <laughs> Go deeper. Yeah. Bye. Bye.